Capillary's training. Did were you able to reach Maria and figure out anything about? Oh, I called her for my go high level number. I think I might just call her for my cell phone. So that's the number that she she knows. But I'll call her after this. Okay. So there's definitely something amiss. Yeah, I agree. It's not even... Um, so, yeah. you're going you're gonna to laugh at me. Did I do this call last week, or has there been a week in between? No, you did last week. Okay, I don't even remember. So I was at, yeah, I was at Realty 1 last week, and then... Okay. I don't remember when I did these things. So yeah, it works out good then just if you're ex expanding, extending on your Hunter Thompson thing. Yep. thing. That sounds good. Yeah. yeah. Let's okay. um just need to ask Marie if she can. Hey, Blake, how's it going? The A-team. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Look out. Yeah, I'm going good. How are you? Good. Uh, are you still, where are you? Actually, that's a better question. The Bahamas. Nah, I'm still in Mexico. <laughs> okay. I was excited. Yeah. That would have been fun. <laughs> I mean, Mexico is still fun. Fluent in Spanish yet? Oh, no, not yet. <laughs> but... I uh, because I have a few different um teachers online and I haven't spoke to this particular one. Um, geez, it'd be a, a while now, maybe. Geez, almost two months probably that I spoke to him last. He's just got other other students and whatnot, and I spoke to him and he was like, sort of like, yeah, you've improved a lot. Like he's like, I'd probably put you at like B one level of um speaking, and I was like, I don't put myself at that. But yeah. B1. Sure. Yeah. But if you ask someone on the street, like, oh, does that guy speak English? They'd be like, no, because for whatever reason, when I'm out, you know, in public, I can't speak. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Like, there's just no confidence there. But online, like, speaking with someone, I could probably speak for like 30 minutes about random stuff. <laughs> That's yeah. cool. Well, 
yeah, it's just not. Do you have an really... accent with your with your Spanish? Now I have I would to know. say so. I would 100%. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I have an accent altogether, right? Like, no matter where you yes, are, you've I'll... got an accent. Really? What? Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> but apparently, I can pronounce the words well. So, that's all that matters, right? As long as you. And I've never had someone say, like, wait, what, what did you say? Like, everyone's always understood me when I spoke. So, that's good. That's good. At least yeah. they don't assume that you can speak it Spanish very well. I get I used to get that with my maiden name, it's Biazzi. So people just assumed that a Maria Biazzi could speak Spanish. Yeah. My sister, because we're half Italian, so my si but my sister actually looks half Italian, unlike me. And Same. yeah. But she has like the brown eyes, the brown hair and tan skin. So like when she was in South America, they would automatically start speaking to her in Spanish and she was like no, not me. <laughs> Got the wrong person. I agree. All right. Well, now we've got, now we got a good group here today. I'm so excited to have you all here. We are doing part two of our Hunter Thompson information. So part one, share my screen. We talked about the introductory call and kind of how to set up that initial conversation with potential investors. What we're going through, what we're talking about, um, words we're staying away from, and really what we're getting to know about this investor. We're getting to know um, why they want to invest, some reasoning that they want, sharing big key moments of your life and why that you are in real estate. So we ended with the post introductory follow up call where we just say thank you and hoping to, and setting up another time to talk to them again. So with that, the introductory call is that big picture. It's where we're really just trying to explain ourselves what we do and get to know them a little bit better. Now we go into the due diligence call. And the due diligence is when we're getting into the details about a deal or multifamily in general. And I've noticed that there's two main things that investors are nervous about. They won't tell you because they don't know it. But they are really nervous about of close and assurance of sale. They worry that the deal isn't going to close and that they they won't get their money back and that the deal is not going to sell and then they won't make any money. So those are kind of the big things that I have in my head when I'm talking to investors is they're always nervous about whether the deal closes and whether the deal sells. So Hunter likes, he has some, um, he's got six points that he likes to get through during the due diligence calls. And his first one um like I said, we're going through Hunter Thompson's Raising Private Capital book. But his first thing is before your due diligence calls, he wants you to practice answering questions that you might get from investors. And I've got a list of 20 questions that we're going to go through in a second. Uh, these are questions that I've gotten from investors. It's not just a list that I found on Google. I promise. So we will be going through those. But he does say that he wants you to practice with a friend or with someone that can actually listen to you talking. Um, that was probably the scariest thing for me was to talk out loud to someone that isn't me. I like talking to myself because I think I'm amazing. That's why it's much easier talking to yourself. But then when you have to talk to someone and explain what you're saying, and that's a lot harder. So that's why Hunter puts it out there. He says talking to someone else helps you um, understand where to take a pause and what you're talking about, where to kind of explain more, or if what you're saying is a little confusing. So that's his first point. His second point is outlining the assumptions of your offering. This one was a little confusing to me. So he likes to say like historically on other properties we've raised rents by a certain percentage or um, on some of our properties we're giving we're giving distributions already. So being able to hit points that, that help make your offering and you sound better. This is when we talk about leverage. Leveraging that when we're raising money for a massive capital deal, you've got 
15 other deals that you can leverage that understanding or what's gone on on those previous properties. So whether you've invested in those deals or you've raised on other deals, it's always good to know some key highlight points. I know I always talk about the North Carolina deal because North Carolina is a great market. I always talk about, hey, we're doing distributions on that one. That So I like to talk about past experiences to help. Um, obviously, we don't have a crystal ball. And when you're talking about a deal, it's not like you can say, it's going to do this. And you're going to get paid on April, April 3rd. No, you can't do that. But it all goes back to those main questions that are running into investors' heads are assurance of close and assurance of sale. They're always concerned about that. So then we go to discussing um, some assumptions that are not in the deck. So if you think about what's in the deck, we kind of talked about this this morning on our um, capital raise call. Our investors, they see the deck and we, we as capital raisers can understand it. We know what's going on. We know what text is behind the text, if you will, on those decks. But sometimes they don't understand the the other things, like when we do monthly updates or when we're going to do quarterly investor calls or when we say, which we got confused on today, if we're doing distributions after nine months, what does that actually mean? So being able to explain the assumptions that might not be in the deck so i go back to that prior to practice prior to call practice i like to pitch the deal to someone who doesn't know real estate i like to pitch it to someone who might ask me more questions when i say assumable loan and they say well what is an assumable loan <laughs> and then i'm like oh <laughs> crap i need to learn that so those are things that that those practice questions those assumed questions that might not be in the deck it might not say hey this is what this means or if you don't know for example in horizon if you don't know the location if someone asks you well is that a good area and you've never been there or you live in Indiana and you've never seen the property, what do you say to that? So kind of understanding before you get into these calls with investors, what kind of questions they might be having. And be honest, be honest about, about your investment. If you're gonna lie to your investor, they're not going to trust you. So you want to be honest with them. If you don't know the answer, that's okay. Um, a lot of the time I say that, I don't know. Let me get back to you, I'll find out and I will make sure I answer that for you. But don't not answer it. Like you need to find that answer, get that information and give it back to those investors. Hunter says, remind them of the deadline. And then at the very end, he asks if they're interested in investing. You are the detective. You're really looking for why they're saying no. You're, you're wondering why they might not invest if they say, well, Oh, it's a lot of money. It might not be money. You're still trying to figure out what that what that reason is. Like I said, it's usually assurance of close and assurance of sale. But want to find out what their big reason is for not investing and then be able to talk them through that. So that is what Hunter talks about on the due diligence calls. He really likes to hone in on using past experiences and other deals to help sell future deals. That's kind of his process. Any thoughts, questions, concerns? Before I go into some questions. Cool. All right, so 20 questions of what I've gotten from investors. And not just me, these are put together from the entire investor relations group. I will zoom in to make it a little bit easier. Let's talk through some of these questions. So I wanna hear what your thoughts are on why invest in investments and not other assets. Uh, I have a counter question to that. Mm -hmm. Why invest in apartments uh, given Maybe some of the issues that's going on, that's been out there in the media, also right. things going on with some of the operators. That could be a kind of question. Exactly. So why? What What would you say back to that, Rosario? Oh, that's always going to go, Maria. We can come up. I can come up with all the questions. 
What's the What's the answers? That's what I want to do. Let's go through them. I know. Rosario gave you another question instead of an answer. I don't have the answer to the either, either question. Yep. <laughs> sure you do. You can't pose a question with a question, Rosario. <laughs> you can't. I just don't like it. So I'd, I'd Rosario's question down there below. I think it's a different one, but um, I forgot what it was. Oh, Is there ask your question again? Uh, sure. Uh, so why invest in apartments given some of the you know issues that some of the operators have been facing lately and are going to be facing later on due to some of the um I guess the uh I guess the COVID, the COVID time of COVID. It's just the it's the it's the reverse of uh, the first question. Why invest in other classes? Why should I? Um, why wouldn't it be better for me to invest in other asset classes right now instead of apartments and then come back to apartments and things? Like that? Assuming that they basically, they're assuming that things are not that great right now. This is probably better. That from, from a more seasoned investor to ask more than someone who just started. Well, even someone who just started may even ask this question too. Um, I've gotten it. So that's true. Let's talk about first why invest in apartments other than like the stock market. Because most of the people are that you will talk to are invested in stock market, Bitcoin. They've got, I talked to someone the other day who's invested in a restaurant. <laughs> he was not excited about that. <laughs> Can't steer the conversation in the opposite direction. But what would you say if someone asks you, why, why apartments? Um, better tax benefits? I don't know. Okay. I don't have an answer to that question yet. This, these are the questions I'm yeah. answering myself. So. It, uh, for me, it depends on the type of investor that I'm that I'm speaking with. Um, mm -hmm. One of the answers that that can answer it is it's a hard asset versus something that's that's liquid or just out in the universe. Um, yep. So having a hard asset is something that that it is. Um, I always go with that one, Janae. I always say, personally, for me, I'm a I'm a tactile learner. <laughs> and I like to learn based on what I see, and I like to see what I'm investing in. So if I can drive to the property, if I can, if I can touch the wall, touch the brick, drive personally to it, that's why I like to invest in it. I can see it with my own eyes. I have a hard time investing in a piece of paper. Could I interject one again, once again? And this is, of course, I'm not, you know, I'm one of the beginners in, the, in this. So you could also do that same thing with self storage. What's the money yes. you say that? I'm just playing devil advocate right now. Of course, of course. But think about it this way, Rosario. Why, why do you invest in real estate versus the um, stock market or versus Bitcoin? Well, it's more predictable. You can't really control what happens with the stock market. Um, of course, for some of the same reasons, tax benefits, power, so like uh, Janae mentioned. Um, again, but I'm still playing devil's advocate. I love it. I Don't love it. Throw and in self storage or some other. I'm not saying I'm trying to invest in self storage. I'm just trying to throw a wrench in there because when people ask questions, they're gonna ask, they're gonna throw realistically they're gonna throw in other things too. Right. 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 And I and I think sometimes you just have to acknowledge that that's a, that's another that's another type of asset that's definitely real estate it's definitely commercial, um, you know I think I think one of the things that so, I like oh go ahead well, go ahead Janae. no go ahead I'm sorry I was just gonna say one of the things that I appreciate about the multifamily space is watching the properties change and the lives improve of the people that are, that live on the property I like knowing that I'm affecting. Um, different groups of people, like my investors, I'm growing their money, the people that live on the properties, I'm improving their lives. Um, I'm doing things that are helping different, 
different groups of people. And, and I like the feeling just that's just my personal space. So that is something that I'll talk about is, is how is how important that is for me. That makes Mike. sense. Also, uh, there's another reason I think there's a reason I can bring up now. Um, people who have lived in apartments, for example, they can now leverage being able to make money from uh, people who decide to rent. And there's an increasing number of people who decide to rent. Also, if you look at the housing market, look at the interest rates, it's not the best. It's it's a better, it seems like a better, uh, it's taking a better, a better risk over, let's say, single family. And once again, I'm, I don't want to, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. It, it's a better, it seems like a much better option. Yes, yeah. I like that. I mean, I always go also to gambling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's still gambling, but go ahead, Mike. So it's a, it's one of the, it's one of the five necessities of life is shelter. People, everybody has to have a place to live. So apartments will be one of those places that people will, will be living. Uh, affordability of buying a, a home is completely separate. Uh, this is like a completely separate uh, line, but uh, with the affordability of buying homes, I think that was what Rosario was kind of saying maybe earlier, uh, is uh, very difficult right now. So it's very difficult uh, to buy a house based on interest rate and other things and overall affordability. So those two things are, you know, and then the other is why apartments is because I can, so instead of having a single house that goes vacant, I can have a hundred units and I have one vacancy. So the scalability and the redu reduction of risk over multiple units from a business sense. I was going to bring that up, Michael, but that, that's definitely a great point. Um, Cause then that's, that can counter, you know, some of the people who are more, who are strictly residential for us thinking about going into residential over the uh, you know, tackling apartments. Because I guess to many, maybe that looking into investing in apartments seems like a larger feat than just one uh, single family. At least with that, it seems more, it's, it's a common, a common investment. Yes. And some, most, most like someone in their family has done it to some extent, whether it be one property or even 10 properties, but they at least have some familiarity there. So I remind everyone, if if they come from a line, and so, so one of the things is you're, you're, we're probably pitching to the hardest people because we're pitching to people in the real estate community and for now, and we got to work our way of getting out of that. So right now you guys are doing the hardest pitches possible because your sort, most of our circles uh, are of investors or people in the community. So I tell, I remind like everyone is like every real estate deal it has opportunity to make money real estate is going to make money whether it's single family or storage or land or whatever that is and we choose apartments because and then you list out a handful of reasons because of the necessity of housing the necessity of shelter the multiplier of 100 units the the fact that you're actually, you know, buying a business versus buying a house, you know, and you you can actually create, you can force the appreciation of an apartment. I can't force much of an appreciation of a house. So. Yeah. These are all good. Yeah, those are both good. And sorry, I joined late, but another thing would be with apartments, I think you have more flexibility to be either passive or active or both. Where with a house, 
you're pretty active. It's hard to be yeah, passive in a house deal unless it's a JV, which that's not very common. I don't know if that's a stretch, but it is it depends on who you're talking to. If you're talking to someone who's been through single family, like like Mike was saying, we are pitching to the to the hard group who's probably come from single family. Right. So I always talk about the tenants, the trash, the termites, and the toilets, the four T's. So I always talk about those that I, I don't want to deal with them. So I like to invest in in a business versus a property it's versus a house, a single family home. Yeah, you're okay. right. It depends on who you're talking to. It fits those folks. For others, it doesn't. But it's kind of, it kind of figures, sorry, Dennis, you were, you came in a bit late, but we are talking about questions that we get from investors. This is great. And, and how, how we handle this. So this first one is very broad with why invest in apart, apartments versus other asset classes. Second one, advantages of multifamily asset class. We've kind of talked about, about some of them with the tax benefits, the predictability, um, maybe a less risk than than other types of investments. Are there any other advantages that you guys has, can think of that we might not be talking about? Okay. Uh, fractional ownership. What was that one? Um, well, I guess never mind. Fractional ownership, you can do that across uh, different, never mind. Or that. related to the syndication. Yeah. Okay. Hey, they're all there's no bad answers. All of these are good. This is brainstorming. All of it is brainstorming. Yeah. Um, I like to for the next question with your investment strategy. It also kind of goes with are you investing in this property? <laughs> you investing in this deal. <laughs> Get that one a lot. Um, what's your investment strategy? Are you investing in this asset? So I'd like to hear what you guys have have said to that or what you might say to that because we're building a trusting relationship with these investors they trust you because you've built that connection with them and whatever you're investing in or whatever you're doing with your investments your strategy they want to follow because they trust you more than the actual physical property so you're trying to convey this story of why you invest and what you're investing in to kind of build that trust with this investor. We talked about on the introductory call that you're you're giving them your last straw moment, the moment that really caused you to get into real estate and then sharing your why. This is kind of different. Now you're telling them why, why you're investing, what your strategy is, and if you're investing in this deal. Uh, that's a heavier one. But what are you gonna, what are some thoughts on that one? I'll, I'll just tell them, tell them I'll be honest and say, no, I haven't invested in this particular asset. But my goal is to uh, be able to make money to where I can invest in. So Rosario, the team, the general partner team is investing, invests in all of their assets. So since you're mm -hmm. part of the general partner team, technically, you okay. invest in Well, that's, that's the thing. I, well, I'm thinking about it from a standing point of they're looking at me more as an individual. That's and true. If I push back, okay, so yeah, from a team standpoint, yes, but from an individual, no, I haven't yet. Yeah, and I'd I'm just thinking with about that. all the questions. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Not no problem. Um, I just want to make sure I'm not. I want to make things up. So they start sure. hammering on. Uh, what have I actually invested in in the past outside of stocks? Uh. I'm just going to be honest. I'm like, hey, I just started. So I flip it around several and, months ago. Yeah, because you can't invest in every deal and they may not necessarily understand that yet. So what I do is I, I flip it and say, I invest in C and B class multifamily apartments where there's an opportunity to create cash flow and value add in a three to five year period. And, um, like this one, you know, <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and then go into the next. And most of the time that takes care of it. Now, some hard nosed person might come back. Well, what about this one? Are you invested? Well, then that's a different conversation. But most people just are looking for a general answer. And I, and I don't feel I'm being disingenuous by answering that way. And I mean, if you disagree, tell me. But um, 
so so early on you you really i mean you still you don't want to lie but you also need to build credibility and confidence and comfort right so uh, i talk about like any investments so i i just will you know talk about any investment that i ever did or made in real estate uh, early on if i need to use that as my base and then i talk about if I'm raising on a deal, I don't have a problem to say, you know, the the partners are, you know, the the GPs on this deal have put 10% into this deal. I'm part of the GP team. Um, you know, and and then, you know, if they ask specifics like how much did you put specifically, uh, then you then you say, you know, whatever the real answer is to that without lying. But I, I start out with the broader answers first because they're not lies and I need to build the credibility around me and the team and the, you know, and, and the focus of everything else. You know, and as, as it goes, then, you know, we get to know each other better and better and better. And okay, the, you know, the answers may change, you know, get, but don't don't start. I agree. Like, don't lie because once I tell one, then I got to tell another one, and I get, keep up with those. So, but yeah. but you know, use your story. Don't don't get shy about the story. And everybody has probably everyone here has invested something into real estate or mentorships or other things that they can use as part of their team, their mentors, their broader partners in uh, the whole everything that happens. Janae, you've been there and done this. You you started out at one side and built up over the last years. You went from the single family to apartments and had to tell the story differently. You got yeah. some ideas to share for some of those that are making that transition as well. well just starting yeah. out. I mean, I, th I think one of the reasons um, in the beginning um, that we started looking at the multifamily was First of all, Amber and I did not want to, we didn't want to be landlords. We didn't want rentals. Um, that was just, we kind of set, set out not doing that. And so when we were flipping houses, we were doing one house at a time and it was, it was a lot of work and a lot of, you know, a lot of managing of people. And we just, I think we got to a point where somebody finally said, um, Hey, why are you doing it one at a time? Why don't you do a hundred at a time? And we started then looking into the multifamily space. Uh, we up to this point in time have done um, LP deals as well as GP deals and have put, um, we've actually put money into every deal that we've done. Um, one of us has. So we, we try to um, try to make that be something that is important for us to be able to do is, is, is do that. Um, I'm trying to think what else. But we, before you, before you were a GP, so I'm not yeah. a G, I'm not a GP in any deal yet, and I'm pitching a deal. Who, you know, um. So what is what is that? What is your story about? So you know? we we actually um, tell the story of going in as as LPs and sitting in on calls and not and listening to like the quarterly calls and not understanding the language. We didn't know as an LP, if we were making money, if we were losing money, we didn't understand the terminology. Um, you know, they would, they would talk about CapEx and we had no idea what cap, like we just didn't know the language. It was, you know, and then um, that was one of the reasons that we started educating ourselves um, in the multifamily spaces. We just didn't know. And so we talk about, we, we tell the story often about how we started down the path because we had um, we had friends, uh, and I, can't, all, I don't know if all of you are big dogs on here. I know we've got a couple of big dogs that are still on here, but um, but you know it was a big dog deal, and so we trusted the we trusted the people that we were going into business with. We trusted the people we were giving our money to, but we didn't have a clue. <laughs> I just didn't even know. So education was really important, and so the first time, the first time we pitched a deal. Um, it was, 
for me, it felt kind of like going home because I did sales for so long, but for Amber, um, it was scary for her. She, she felt like she was trying to convince people to do something that she wasn't sure that she was doing. So I think that's, that's important to, to understand as well is that you're, you want to, you want to make sure you're sharing, you're sharing this as an opportunity. Um, you're not sharing it as you're trying to sell somebody something. It's an opportunity and a person can either, you know, come on board and grow with you or they can watch, watch things happen um, from the sidelines and then, then start getting involved. That, that makes sense. Uh, Investing so then, is not, not just money. Investing is also weird. Hmm? But you can also invest your time and invest in yourself. All of you invested in education. I joined three education programs before I'm here. So I invested in myself first. So I couldn't invest in some of our properties because I spent a lot of money in education. So I also share that. I share that I've invested in the team. I've invested in relationships. I've invested in these groups and getting to know the team. And that's where my trust is. And that's what I've invested in too. So the first time I, I raised, I didn't have money to put into the deal. And that was when I told them, I told my story of how I got into this and I'm investing my time and my money into the education side of it so that we can manage it. I can manage it on the side while they're investing as a limited partner. That's a good point. Um, so I'm right along those same lines of, I invested money, a lot of money <laughs> uh, into education. Um, and I tried to go down the residential route. And then I realized that after learning about commercial, that commercial seems to be a better fit. Uh, so I'm going to try to work on my story a little bit more instead of saying, oh, I haven't invested in anything. I've had, I invested quite a bit, actually. So Exactly. It's actually and a just, good story. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, it's, it's shortening that timeline because you want them yeah. to be able to to not do the same things that you did. You want them to to invest in a, in a, prop, a multifamily property and not go along to those same lines of single family which rosario that's part of your story that you gotta you gotta use to your advantage building it's that like trust. janae was saying i mean they were doing a lot of single family that's what i would i had that story too i mean i was doing fine with some single family but a lot of work and it's like i can scale a lot better it, it took me time to figure out i could scale a lot better in multifamily. okay well where how do I do that? Where are the right people to do that? Go get educated, right? Go make some relationships with some people and learn who's doing it right. And it's like anything, there's good folks and there's bad folks, right? It, you just gotta mm -hmm. sort through them, kiss some frogs and find the good ones, right? So that's what they're doing. That's what these people are doing, right? So I I like the way Janae talked about uh, she didn't say it this way, but this is the way it sounded to me. You're meeting them where they're at, right? I mean, they're coming from all these different perspectives and they just want some honesty and some transparency to realize they're not in this alone. You know, we were like this, we were like that too, you know, yeah. <laughs> take a step forward and we're here with you, you know, that kind of thing. It's the end of the day, one, Go ahead, Janae. I was just going to say, I think one of the the things and maybe it's down here later there are questions mm -hmm. that people have but it really comes to you listening listening to the person that you're speaking with I mean it's if you can if you can address their fears or their concerns or answer you know um, the question the list of questions that they have condenses and you can you know you can really it's more about building the trust with them versus answering their very specific questions. Uh, and, and I think that's really important is listening to what they're telling you. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's why you're a detective. You're really figuring out, they have a list of questions. They've got 20 questions that maybe they're going to ask you, but there's really only one that they care about. And you have to find that one because when you figure that out, when you find it out based on the questions, based on what they're saying, when you figure out what their one question, their one hold back, hold back of not investing is, as long as you can ease that, you've got an investor for life, not just for Horizon or just for one deal. You've got them 
for life because that's the goal. You want to help these people invest in all of your properties. So you've got to figure out in these conversations, maybe what's their holdback. They ask their investing strategy. They want to know what you're doing. They're trying to figure out more about you. You're also trying to figure out more about them. So if they are single family, I'm going to talk about single family. Personally, I haven't started in single family, but maybe I'll talk about my friend Janae who did. And maybe I'll start saying, you know, I've learned from a lot of people and that's why I didn't have to start in single family. So you, you're really utilizing all of that information. It's a conversation and you're always trying to figure them out. Uh, so that's one thing I wanted to add. I forgot I had, I didn't forget I had this conversation. I just, it just came to me now. Uh, so there was another investor in the same network of Big Dog Network. She was telling me about her frustration. I had to send similar frustration. Uh, it was last week. We spent like an hour talking about this. And I basically convinced her to come over come on to the commercial. Because it's, it's it's not as, it doesn't seem as hectic as dealing with some of the, uh, you know, the homeowners going on the foreclosure or some other or probate or any, any other type of situation. So instead of dealing with one particular homeowner, you can deal with multiple uh, tenants. Not directly, of course, of course, as a buffer, but I explained a lot of that uh, in the conversation, so. Exactly, exactly. You're always trying to figure them out what, what their main problem is. This preserve that person might've just been, they're dealing with one tenant. And when they lose that one tenant, it's hard to find another one. They're not getting income from that. And then pushing the conversation to, again, why multifamily is better. You're just, you're trying to figure out what what's their big, big block in their mind. So it kind of goes into the next one. Why value add in apartments? Um, I love value add. I love this question. Hello. This one just makes me <laughs> smile. I love value add. I love when they're really ugly because then we get to make them beautiful. And the before and after pictures are just amazing. When it's a class A and then you just, you know, there's not much you can do. It's not like you haven't it's done enough. And for those of us that have done single family, when you walk into a house, it's a hoarder house or a house that hasn't been clean for 25 years and has no upgrades. It's kind of like the same thing. You're going to make, I know yeah. you get for bang for your buck when you can do that versus buying something that's already fixed up. So I kind of look at it. If I'm talking to single family people, I'll, I'll position it that way. Yeah. Or if you guys have done property tours, have you ever seen, like, if you've been on one with Amberwood, we've toured that one a few times, or even McCallum, you've seen where it started or like, a, or a unit that they haven't renovated. And then you go to see one that's renovated and it's just like, oh my gosh, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Love value add. So that's yeah, what I And I again, there, if you're asking them questions and listening, if you haven't by this point, this is a good time to ask them. Well, so when you invest, what are you really looking for? Are you looking for cash flow? Or are you looking for a return? And if they're looking for return, <laughs> that's value add, right? I mean, and they may just not understand that yet, right? But I mean, it, it's kind of like a stock, you know, if you were buying a stock, are you buying it for dividend? Or are you buying it for growth, right? right. There's similarities, right? So if they're coming from single family, is it a fixer upper or did you buy a new build? Right. I mean, it, there's a lot of so by this, if you understand where they're coming from, you can use examples, I think, that might align to where they're coming from mm -hmm. and draw the similarity. And then the light bulb goes on. And it's exactly. like when I made the transition or making the transition, I was doing Burr model with single family. And this is Burr on a multi scale. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. not to oversimplify, but I mean, that's what it is. Exactly. And you, and sometimes people, I've had this, someone ask me this question because they looked where the apartment was. I think it was actually on Horizon. They looked up and they didn't like the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it wasn't Horizon, but it was one of them and they didn't like the neighborhood. And because I had talked about how much I love value add and how much I see the potential. And then you go back to Janae's point earlier of you're improving the lives of the tenants. You're giving them a better place, a safer place to live. When you can turn those around, you're actually answering the main problem in their head is I don't want to invest in a property that has that isn't in a safe area. That's what they were really asking about, not why mm -hmm. the value add. 
maybe that's why they were asking. So you, that's why you're trying to figure out what their main main reason is. And it does take time. It takes time having these conversations. The first one is the hardest. And, and the second, third, and 50th is the hardest. But it gets easier when you, when you start to figure out and you have those better conversations. It does get easier. So that's why I say and value that. I, I love it personally. I get excited about it. I always like to say I, it's not like putting lipstick on a pig, but I live in Indiana and I come from a farm life family. So it kind of works out. <laughs> so I get this one a lot. Maybe you guys have heard this one. Uh, why invest with massive capital and not other operators? Now, for me, I don't like to put down other people because we're all in this business together. We're all trying to help people invest in our properties. I might not get along with other people, but no one else needs to know that. So I like to turn this into a positive and go into why I chose to invest with Massive Capital. I like to turn it around um, to each their own. I, want to tell I you agree. How to That's people. the way I would do it too. And just then rattle off, you know, whatever you think the attributes are, but I mean, it'd be stuff like, um, you know, very rigorous underwriting model that builds in buffers and is very data driven. So, you know, you can, I don't like to say conservative underwriting because everybody says that, but very accurate and data driven underwriting that has a lot of confidence in it. And then, um, you know, a lot of experience showing that that model works. And so there's mm -hmm. confidence and experience. Um, and I think more and more so, and this, we've talked about this before, is, is highlighting stronger the whole asset management side because people don't understand that until they get into it. But people are starting to wake up to some of that, right? I mean, that's where the deal gets done or not. And there's some, there's some um, proven success there that, that the team has, right? So mm -hmm. that one's a little trickier because it get, you, can, you can get detailed in a hurry, but you know. It's also a great gray area on that one because sometimes a, they're yeah. trying, they're trying to to get you, they're trying to have your their gotcha moment or, mm -hmm. or like maybe they're trying to see, they're trying to read you out. Maybe they've already talked to another team. And so they're mm -hmm. trying to base that. You never know. You really never you don't know. know. But you know, hit them with a couple of the strong underwriting and and you know experienced team and then you know and, and and very transparent too you know hey any questions you have that's everything's open you know we want to be an open book and and find people that want to succeed together right so not all operators are that way i wouldn't say that to them but you know, I, I, well so. i was going to say i don't think that that's a, a bad thing so we we typically position it as we we partner with massive capital often because number one, they have the entire team. Everything mm, that you point. need is in place. They have it all. You know, they've got everything from being able to sign on the loans to underwriting the deals to having, you know, contract to close stuff. They I mean they have all the pieces in place that you would need, including the asset management space. So we that's one of the benefits. Um, the other one is, you know, we can, and we say we have looked at and partnered with, with other, with other, with other groups and just find that this, that massive capital fits our, our personal profile better, the integrity, the transparency, the, um, the, the honesty, uh, the ability for us to be they're a phone call away like this team is a phone call away if we need something if we have questions on something not just because we're students but because that's just who they are as human yeah. beings and that's I fantastic people, and that's... i'll just tell people that they're they're some of the best human beings on the planet and 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 they would they would literally give you know the shirt off their back if they could to answer questions and work with you so I, I, and that's that is truthfully what i say to people that's why we continue to to partner and work with massive is because because of the who the principles are just in in being you know themselves 
I'm glad Again, you're recording and, uh, this. This is good. Yeah, I was like, and uh, <laughs> good thing we just got right there. Perfect. Next question. Done. Perfect. Love that one today. <laughs> uh target markets some you we might not get this one as often what your target market are mar what your target markets are and what areas and cities i if i get this one i go back to the team that's underwriting i always like to throw it back to that team and what they're looking at and how they're underwriting so many deals at a time and picking just the best one i i like to kind of have that conversation around it um so it kind of goes along with the next few ones like target market why you're choosing these this market and uh, and what the minimum investment amount is that's all stuff that's on cash flow portal typical returns on an investment that that one's easy from what your uh what what the deck is saying hold period you know that one of five years again it's every deal is different but that one's pretty much with the deck uh can we use our ira account for investing this leads into thursday thursday on our capital raise massive massive masters call we're learning how a like how to invest with an ira and how that can be so beneficial a lot of people do not know that you can invest your ira we talk about it all the time. Lots here of people don't know that. Right. But it's it's not common knowledge. So this one is something that I'm still constantly understanding myself. So it's something that we're always continuing to learn about, always continuing to help. Because some people, they'll say, I don't have 50K to put into a deal. It's like, well, actually, I bet you do. <laughs> Let's, let's I can help about, you find it. Would let you me help you find it. If I can find it, will you invest it? <laughs> uh, I want to add something else uh, to this. What about life insurance? Uh, well, life insurance policy that'll allow you to make investment. Can that be a separate yes. question? Too? It depends on the life insurance. Are you talking like whole life or with the universal life stuff that has like a savings aspect to it? Yeah. Yeah, it depends so on the like, policy, but that's what I've done. There's a lot of them that you can take a loan out on those and tax free event. And I mean, you have to pay interest back, but um, in fact, I have a question to my accountant about writing off that interest. But that's I digress. Um, but it's good, so you you know that, and that's what we try to leverage is those understanding. For me personally, I didn't, I don't know that stuff. I, I just had a call with an investor in one of our deals who does that. So he was explaining it to me. So just it's it's part of education that we want to be able to utilize. I I I know we've had people invest their and their life insurance policies. I personally don't know how to do that. So Rosario, I will find out and get back to you. Zara, did they help? I think you can. I think you can though. I just I don't have all the details. I'm learning about it all myself. Right. Well, I'm with a CPA. Yeah, so. I know some of them, you just, it has to be in a self directed form. Um, I think. Mike, do you have anything to add on that one? You're on mute, Mike. He's thinking deep in thought. Uh, <laughs> no, I was sharing. I was sharing. But yeah, yeah, you, you, you can definitely. Uh, the, you know, and I think Dennis was sharing as well, but there's, and there's different ways out of those, your, of, of your whole life type of insurance policies, like they're, they're all slightly different, but it becomes part of that uh, infinite wealth kind of process that a lot of people talk about. So it's, it is scenarios. Most people that are into that probably, I would say the majority of them already know that unless so unless you're out there uh, selling the insurance, I don't know that it's a big selling point uh, for that, but you can let people know, hey, if you have whole life policies that build up uh, you know, value, some people may not realize that they have a whole life pol policy that builds up value and they, you know, they can either take the money out or take the loan against it you know, whatever interest rate they want to define. So you can define your own interest rate in a lot of those. So I can like, 
define an interest rate I'm going to pay myself back at out of out of my policy and decide what I want to do with that money uh, at that time. So it doesn't go through an IRA. It's you're going to invest it directly through that. And you're basically doing a withdrawal, a loan of type of uh, scenario. Awesome. Um, what are the tax advantages with apartment investing? Oh man, this one. Janae knows we get this a lot. <laughs> Janae gets love this a lot, really? I love this one and hate this one. At the same time. Why do you hate it? It's a... Well, because there's, I mean, I'll tell you why I hate it. I hate it because people advertise it as a tax savings and it's really like you have to understand where the tax savings will come in it's right. only you know there's a select group of people and so people see it and hear that and then they just they just think that they can write a fifty thousand dollar check and then fifty thousand dollars their taxes are going to be gone oh uh, it's a it's it's a, it's it's very, overhyped and yeah, miscommunicated and, and, yeah yeah kind of it kind of feels like and, you know, I just think people are not educated about it and they don't really advertise it correctly. And so it can be, it, it just makes people feel like they're being misled unless you really can walk them down the path of this is mm -hmm. where it would be beneficial to you. And this is how you can utilize it. But it, again, it's, it's a select ish group of people. It's a great point you made Janae, because what we do when we're raising capital is we're managing our investors' expectations. And we need to help them by by really educating them on, on taxes. We are not tax professionals. And I do I'll always answer this question by starting, I am not a tax professional. I am not a CPA or licensed attorney. However, <laughs> and then I go into talking about it because you really want to manage their expectations. Mm -hmm. If they get a, when when they get a K one from you or from the deal, and they go, I don't know what to do with this. It's not going to say here's fifty thousand dollars of depreciation. No, it's offsetting your passive income. So if they don't have any passive income, then there's nothing to offset. Right. So yeah. so it. I agree, Janae. It's it's something that we have to be able to explain. So that's why we're always constantly educating ourselves. That's why we have Bill Pilkington on a lot of our Wednesday calls so that we can help educate. Because we don't want our whole call to be talking about taxes. It does help. Um, it offsets some of the some of the passive income from the sale of the property, you can talk about that. You can really talk about tax benefits, but just remember you are not a tax professional, unless any of you are. If you are, congrats, like answer that no, one. No, I, I think y'all are good at, about that on the webinars and stuff. It's That's the right way to do it. It's, I'm not a tax a financial professional and consult your advisors for details, but here's what I have learned and give right. them an example of something, right? Yeah. Or even send them the link to the call. Yeah, yeah. Or send them one of, of one that you found. It's an I'm not a tax professional, but this video, I'm going to send you this video. Yeah. It's only 30 minutes or it's 25 minutes about how to really take advantage of it. Because you really want to help them, but you also don't want to mislead them. Right. Because we're not tax professionals or okay. CPAs. No, I do. Would, I do like to say I've, I've heard some people just say, all you do is you take your K-1 to your CPA and that's it. <laughs> I was like, oh, OK, <laughs> well, all right. Oh. There's that. You can do that. Um, I always do also say that if you do have a CPA, please don't use Rocket Mortgage. That might not work as well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or not, or like, or any of those things. Like when people are trying to do their taxes online, not market mortgage. Um, what am I trying to say? Oh, TurboTax uh, or TurboTax, like TurboTax, yeah. doing your taxes online. Like, have a CPA. Yeah. Um, make yeah. sure that they understand real estate when you're sending them, giving them a K one. I like to educate on that as well. That they have a solid real estate CPA. Rocket Turbo. Thanks. I don't know. There's all. Something make you, like that. Make, make you go fast. <sighs> yeah. All right. This one. I want to hear everyone's opinion on this one. All right. 
Cost segregation. Oh, that's a fun What one. is cost segregation? I'm jumping off. See you, you guys later. Off. Have a good one today. Bye, guys. Good night. Is, isn't this, um, I'll stress some of my ignorance here. Um, isn't this where you go and you hire, you usually hire somebody um, and they'll come in and they'll identify things that can be um, appreciated faster? Kind of. Like, might. like appliances might, like, might depreciate faster than other parts of the building, that kind of thing. Is that what it is? Correct. That's mainly it. You're, you're okay. just seeing what, uh, you know, they see what is like uh, fixed, fixed versus what is, uh, can be moved and okay. uh, kind of disposable in a way so that you, they will depreciate some of that stuff faster than okay. the, the fixed fix. So people come up with some very unique ways even in building properties to where like even the sheetrock can be appreciated higher because they put it together with tape instead of, you know, pounding it in. Really? That's interesting. Yeah, so <laughs> so that, that is it. But it's, you know, we use a company, Madison Spec. Madison Spec does all of our cost segregation studies for us, and they provide upfront estimates based off of property, and uh, they, they do an online assessment. So we start with that um, in the cost segregation study. And then that cost segregation study rolls into uh, number 14. So the cost segregation study is, is is also collapsing how much can be depreciated faster instead of 27 and a half years for everything. Some of it's going to be five, seven, 15, and so forth. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's capturing it more quick. And then you roll it into your depreciation schedule, number 14. And with the depreciation schedule, you have the, you know, the standard depreciation, which will still be uh, using the cost segregation study. So the normal depreciation with a cost segregation study still collapses things into earlier years. So you, you actually depreciate more early on. And then with the once, once and with the approval of the, the new or the revised revision of the law, or bonus depreciation back to 100%, then you'll be able to collapse even more into the first year of, of depreciation. Yeah, 12, 13, and 14 actually are all synonymous. Yeah. They're, or they're all kind of, symbiotic. they're all kind of, yes. Symbiotic, there you go. Yeah. That's nice, nice word there. So we are at time. Yeah, this is good. Are you gonna, We'll this keep is scrubbing this and you'll post it somewhere. This is good. this is in the education folder. So okay. not can you, go, can you go to the folder and make sure that's the one that they everyone has access to? If you, is it in the it is in so we've no. we've been doing some cleanup massive and... education. Uh, so it needs uh, to go up. It to yeah, go so up. it needs to go up a level of No, wait, no, uh, go, scroll, okay, hold, slow down. No, you're right here, Maria, hold on. It's a student library. I swear, yeah, move to their place. Thank you. It is called the Call Script, Hunter Thompson, and it's what I've learned from his teachings and sprinkled in with our own massive flair. Yeah, his book is good. Uh, it's a good one. Yeah, it's a good one. That's a good book. Um, Rosario, if you haven't read it, you should or listen to it audio. Have you? Rosario, do you know what we're talking about? Uh, um, yeah, she's got Raising Capital for Real Estate. <laughs> Literally right here next yeah. to me. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, I read it. Yeah, I read that back in December, I think. I should probably yeah. read it again. Worry. It's good. It's a good one. It's yeah. Conversation. And that's kind of what we're taking here is really just 
the more we talk about it, the more we practice it, the more we go through it, the easier it gets. And, and kind of going, practicing these questions, how we're going to answer them is going to help us when we talk to investors. We can only get better. And sometimes yep. we'll learn it. Maybe one answer isn't going to work out with someone. Oh, that's okay. Then, then we know that how we can get it for the next time. But practicing these answers, practicing with people is going to get us to get a lot yep. of help. Good stuff. Well, all right, everyone. It was another great call. We'll see you next time. And okay. thanks. Have a great evening. Good. Have a great evening. Bye. Thank you all. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Maria, for thanks. running this today. No problem. Beautiful. <laughs> see you, Mike. All right. Bye bye.